You're listening to the Inquisitive Red Podcast, the show that brings you philosophical ponderings of your life from a bird's eye view. Now, here's your host, Shah. Welcome to the Inquisitive Rain Podcast. It's Shaw here, your host. Thank you so much for joining me again today. And I hope that you find this topic interesting. I certainly do. Today, we're going to talk about the issue, or let's say the process or, and the history of hypnosis, hypnotherapy, all things hypno. So I'll start out by just saying to you guys how a little bit about how I got interested in hypnotherapy, what led to it, and and we'll go from there. So I got interested in hypnotherapy in the 90s. I was in a very lovely job uh, in fashion uh, as an area sales manager. So I was covering most of London, uh, also the M25 corridor. So I, I'm going to say a few names here that may bring back some nostalgia for some some of you. I would have to go into Bentles, Alders. Oh my goodness, it's bringing back memories for me. Uh, and of course, Fortnum and Mason is still around. Bentles and Alders have long gone, uh, but also House of Fraser and uh, probably every you know. Of course, Selfridges, Harrods, they were my main stores, but. Uh, Anyway, I I feel like I'm going off on a tangent here, but it was a little bit stressful. However, it was excellent. I had lots of energy around it, but it wasn't, it was before then that I got interested in hypnosis. So it was in the 80s and I don't mind, you know, you'll know my age by me talking about some of these things. I was an extra on a lot of movie sets and videos, and I won't go into the ones I did, but it was so much fun. And uh, I noticed, especially on the movie sets where I was an extra, uh, or maybe I even had a part and it was cut out, but I noticed that producers or directors mainly would become extremely stressed and all they could do, their only response was to shout or dictate or berate whomever was in their way. And I saw a lot of people uh, quite distressed by that. And that was mainly the actors and everybody else around. Uh, The extras, you know, it wasn't a big deal. But I do remember seeing uh, quite a few reactions to that. And it, it piqued my interest about stress and how people deal with stress, and how uh, stress affects everyone differently, and I watched people react very differently. And so I became interested in meditation and yoga around that time as well, so that it was for my own uh, purposes, just to relax and learn how to center myself. So this, what people, the mainstream call New Age, it's not new at all. And um, for me, it was in the 80s that I started really becoming very interested in yoga. So, which led me to the meditative part and then reading up about hypnosis. But it wasn't until the 90s that I actually did a course. The first course I signed up for, uh, there were two, it was very, there were two sides to it. One was the camaraderie and the sociability it was held in Derby, so I had to go from London to Derby every month. It was a year's course, or maybe it wasn't that long, I can't remember now. But the overall structure of the course wasn't necessarily that great. And so I ended up doing another course, which was excellent, the Institute of um, Clinical Hypnosis. So Nicola Martin, who ran, or may still run it, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I need to email her, actually. And so... Immediately, my first day there, and even just speaking to them before I decided to join, I thought I better research this one first. You know, I better do some more research. So I did, and I immediately I knew there was a change there, and it was brilliant, absolutely fantastic. So I would highly recommend them. Uh, well, you know, it's all changed now, but anyway. So I trained in hypnotherapy, and during that course, we covered everything neuropsycho biology, we covered neuroscience, we covered life coaching, 
uh, there were lots of different elements. It wasn't just hypnotherapy. It was all of science and really delved in. And of course, um, just in my interest in psychology overall, I, you know, was a sponge. And so for me, it came easy to me. But one of the things that was really funny, uh, I was actually a smoker back then. But I was never a heavy smoker. You know, I'd smoke a couple a day or something. So I had my cigarettes in my pocket. We had a break time during the course. And we, we had come to the section about stopping smoking. And that was for a couple of days, you know, quite deep uh, training about that. But I remember the very first day. Uh, so we, she, she did the lecture. And then she did a meditation or the hypnotherapy around it, you know, because you have to learn it. You do the hypnotherapy yourself in order for you to learn how to apply it to other people. But we did that. And then, you know, she said, okay, there's a break. So we went out for break. I had my cigarettes in my pocket. And before that, I, you know, of course, I'd plan on having a cup of coffee or something and a cigarette. From all I can say is from that moment on, I never smoked again. I forgot the cigarettes were in my pocket. It wasn't until probably a few days later when I was cleaning out my jacket pocket that I found them. I, in other words, I had stopped smoking just like that, just like that and haven't smoked since. So I had stopped smoking and hadn't intended to, <laughs> hadn't really intended to. And, but, you know, okay, you can look at it many ways. Maybe I did intend to, and maybe that, you know, we can look at all those things. However, the story I'm sticking with is that I never intended to stop, at least not on that day. At some point, I would have stopped. Uh, but, you know, I would ask myself, too, how could I be a hypnotherapist helping people? And I was a smoker. Well, you'd be surprised. There are many hypnotherapists who smoke. And they still do stop smoking sessions. I don't get it, but they do. I've witnessed it. I've seen it happen. I've seen it. I've seen, uh, you know, people. I used to know hypnotherapists who smoke. So that for me was a confirmation, validation that not only did it all work, but also the power of the mind, the power of the unconscious mind. And so I was quite keen uh, to finish the course so I could get in there. Now, interestingly enough, because of the first course, I had already started my practice. So I was already seeing clients. So that piqued my interest. And I had a very successful hypnotherapy practice, still have. But in the 90s, uh, the buzzword stress was everywhere. And when I would put an ad, believe it or not, in a local newspaper, which is what we used to do, I got loads of clients. So at one point, I was seeing eight to 10 people a day uh, for various issues, stress, phobias, stop smoking was huge, still is one of my biggest uh, issues that I treat. I wondered, you know, I needed to know a bit more about the history because we were, we were very practical in the training. And yes, we did cover semantics, you know, we looked at history, but I started to delve in myself, which is something I tend to do. Um, which is quite interesting because when I did my master's in psychology, I dreaded the research part. It was I, I, I would do it and I was curious. The process itself was challenging for me. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Uh, so I just want to talk now a little bit about the history of hypnosis because it's been around for centuries. When you go back in time uh, to the history of the ancient Babylonians, the Greeks, the Egyptians, we learn that hypnosis has been used throughout. Hippocrates used hypnosis. And hypnosis takes its name from the Greek word hypnos, which means sleep. The actual state of hypnosis is not actually REM sleep, dream state. So you're not asleep. The trance state has been experienced by using many different means, such as bells, drums, whistles, clapping, dance. In later days, the ticking of clocks was used, as we know, the metronomes, 
the swinging of stopwatches, which has become synonymous with scary movies, uh, and swinging pendulums, of course, which are a key symbol for hypnosis. In fact, some of history's most consulted books, such as the Hindu Vedas and the Bible, show examples of similar uses that induce a trance state. But for the purposes of a chronological timeline, the following is a modified history, I would say, in the Western world, um, because we could go on and on. So just for the purposes of this podcast. So in 1975, the term mesmerism was derived by Franz Mesmer, who coined the term animal magnetism. You will have all heard that term at some point, hopefully. So shortly afterwards, 1784, a term called somnambulism, which is a very deep trance state, was coined by Count Maxime de Puzegu. I hope I said that right. And somnambulism is a very interesting state. It really is the bit, it's not the catatonic, which is when people are stiff. It is the bit when you go into a deep, 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 deep state. It's where you you feel you, if, if the hypnotherapist said to you, raise your right hand, you could, but it's a struggle and you barely, barely raise it. It's a real chore to move. So in 1821, France experimented with painless dentistry with the use of magnetism. So this caused, of course, an accelerated interest throughout France. And it led to Ambrose Liebel, who was a neurologist, and uh, J.M. Charcot, which a lot of people know, to research and investigate the trance state. And later, Charles Richet experimented with hypnosis. So these are all leaders in the scientific field. In 1791, right through to 1868, so we're still way back there, the professor of London University, John Elliotson, supported the use of mesmerism and used the trance state to perform over 1,800 surgeries. So people often say, well, how could that be done? It was. And Mr. Elliston uh, was also the president of the Royal Medical and Surgical Society of London. So here we have all scientists still involved. So it is quite extraordinary that in this day and age, people still aren't quite sure. They're still calling it, no, you know, it's not a science. Nothing's been proven. And the hypnotherapy still suffers from that, a lack of support. From 1795 through to 1860, James Braid, who was a Scottish optician, so we're still in science here, he's a physician as well, he investigated mesmerism. So he wanted to know about this trance state. You know, mesmerism and the trance state were intertwined then. So his findings were that he didn't think people were actually mesmerized. He thought they appeared to be asleep. So he renamed uh, the trance state hypnosis taking from the Greek word hypnos, which means to sleep. Uh, And this has prevailed ever since, for whatever reason. Maybe it's because it sounds a bit better, hypnosis. In 1845 through to 1926, so now we're approaching the 20th century here, Emily Q, a Frenchman uh, living in Paris, created what he called the auto-suggestion, giving suggestions to the subconscious mind, which everybody knows about is synonymous with hypnosis whilst you're in a trance state. And he found it effective in conjunction with the trance state. He also discovered what we now call affirmations. So we're looking at early 1900s here where affirmations first came along. His most famous one, uh, which is used by uh, Louise Hay, and then it was made famous by Louise Hay. But his most famous one is, every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. Every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. So that was from Emile Coup, a Frenchman. 
And that was in the early 1900s. So this was not discovered by Louise Hay, surprise, surprise, as most modern practitioners attest to. Uh, although, you know, Mrs. Hay has had a very significant contribution, in my opinion, to modern day psychology. She's brought it to the forefront. So we're going back just slightly, 1883 to 1887, the father of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud, of course, he was fascinated with hypnosis. I could go on about this topic, but don't worry, I won't. Uh, but he was fascinated because it involved the subconscious mind. But he actually found the concept difficult to grasp, putting it into practice. His own personal experiences of trying to use hypnosis weren't successful. My personal opinion after reading a lot of literature from him, his experience, is that he just was very stuck in his analytical mindset, uh, which really does limit your consciousness about a new modality. But also, I don't believe he was just very good at hypnosis, and some people aren't. It takes a certain thing, I find. And even with colleagues I've trained with, a lot of them never went into practice. I do believe, just like every other profession, it has to be your path. And hypnosis wasn't his. Um, but, you know, he didn't suffer in other ways, did he? So, you know, all these years, and we're still talking about him. So, in 1891, a very favorable report on the use of hypnosis in the medical field was issued by the British Medical Association. So, you know, when you look back, there was a real turn of events. So, we're coming more now towards the 20th century, 1901 to 1980, uh, Milton H. Erickson, MD, medical doctor, psychiatrist, psychotherapist, pioneer in the practice of hypnosis. Now, he's most noted for his use of uh, metaphors, storytelling, and storytelling, and um, his unconventional approach to psychotherapy. He was the founding president of the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis. He's a highly recognized author in many people reference his books on hypnosis. So I would say Milton H. Erickson was more of the uh, giving the suggestions, giving the positive suggestions, but also he used a lot of storytelling as well. And he would use the metaphors such as uh, see yourself, you know, walking down the road, there are two paths and, uh, you know, it just get a feel. If you look down the left path, if you look down the right, and one day you walk down the left and you see, you know, so it's storytelling, metaphors, and it's the left because it's the left brain, you see. And you're looking at the right path because, you know, you're not saying it's left brain, but these, this is the metaphorical meaning. So this is why everyone can't do hypnosis I'm going a little bit off topic for a second, but I believe this is why, you know, all these apps being done by people who know nothing about the wording, nothing about how to formulate real hypnosis and use a lot of what Erickson used. These apps may help you relax and sleep, which is a real good feat. It's a it's success. Making permanent change, that's something hypnotherapy can help with, those apps won't help with because they're not hypnosis. They're not done by a practitioner. So my suggestion is if you're going to use a sleep, uh, you know, help with sleep, MP3, get one from a hypnotherapist like myself who actually knows what they're talking about. So in 1914, during uh, World War One. Hypnosis became widely used to treat amnesia cases. So and the cases of amnesia are very interesting. Um, I, I will just quickly say on that, I believe that when people have alcohol amnesia, you know, when they get so drunk they forget what they've done, I find that's very separate. In my own practice, working with people one-to-one, -one, I don't believe people can recall what happened in an alcohol-induced amnesia. 
but that's my own practice. I'd love to hear what other professionals think about that, people. Or if you've had hypnosis to try and remember something where it was an alcohol-induced amnesia, let me know. So in 1925 through 1947, the U.S. sees the use of dental hypnosis, one of my favorites to use. You know, we all, as practitioners, I believe we all have our favorites. And a lot of my colleagues, you know, because I have lots of friends in the business, uh, and some of them have gone on to do other things now, but when we have discussed, you know, on the surface, what we what we like doing, uh, for me, a lot of it's the clinical, the clinical stuff, the dental surgery, the, you know, childbirth, that kind of thing. But also, for me, the phobias. So in 1968, medical doctors and dentists saw the founding of the British Society of Medical and Dental Hypnosis. This was excellent, but it's 1968. And although a lot of these organizations still exist, I, I don't really see a lot of people doing or pushing forward a lot of research still. It seems to have gone by the wayside and maybe they're tired out, which is understandable. You know, how long can you keep saying to people, right, here's, here are all my case histories, here are all, here's everything, here's the results, and them saying, well, we can't scientifically prove it. In 1973, in the UK, the National Council for Psychotherapists established the Hypnotherapy Register, which later became the National Council for Hypnotherapy, which still exists. It's the first hypnotherapy register that I joined when I established my private practice. Podcasting can be a minefield when you're first starting out, so it was really important that I find the right partners. The team at Buzzsprout is passionate about helping you succeed. Join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. Follow the link in the show notes to let Buzzsprout know that I sent you, and you'll get a free Amazon gift card if you sign up for a paid plan. You also support the show. Now, back to the show. In 1977, the British Society of Experimental and Clinical Hypnosis was founded. So it was exclusive to psychologists, though, which is very interesting. So, you know, 1977, you still didn't have a lot of lay people, I I use that term, and people who weren't scientists, uh, using hypnosis because it was still seen as a medical treatment. In 1979, the Institute of Hypnosis and Parapsychology, where I trained, this was the first place that I trained for hypnosis, was mentioned in the House of Commons. It was acknowledged as using a code of ethics and conduct And it was also noted that all members adhered to the Advertising Standard Authority's requirements. Uh, The organization no longer exists. Now, as I said to you earlier, I trained in the 90s. Um, I did find it good. As I say, there were good things and not so great things about it. Uh, Yes, that's all I can say about that. Why completely revisit the past? Uh, it no longer exists, and I think it's for various reasons, really. So, in 1984, the London College of Clinical Hypnosis, the LCCH, and the British Society of Clinical Hypnotherapists were founded. So, I have had some wonderful training at the LCCH, the London College of Clinical Hypnosis. I did lots of different things about panic and trauma and you know, past life regression, lots of different things there. Uh, so I, I do I do recommend them. In 1987, the formation of the British Society for the Practice of Hypnosis in Speech Therapy was formed. And going back just a little bit uh, to 1980, the Institute of Hypnosis and Parapsychology uh, evolves into the Association of Stress Management. Now, that was a part of the 
the hypnotherapy course that I did. So that was the same institution. I should have said, said that a moment ago. So they no longer exist, but offshoots of them have formed throughout the UK. So this is where I obtained my original hypnoanalysis diploma and my stress management diploma. And the courses were in Derbyshire at the time. So the stress management part was very good. It was just the hypnosis training. I didn't find that I got what I, everything I needed. However, I will say the hypnoanalysis part was very good. I had planned to train as a counselor anyway. So I knew that um, I could incorporate hypnosis with the analysis part. In 1991, uh, PSI Services PLC, it's a commercial company, they offered stress management and hypnosis techniques, and they offered employee assistance programs to British commercial industry. That was a huge feat. I think in the 90s, this is where the boom happened with stress management, stress treating stress, becoming aware of stress, how it affects you, and of course, uh, training in helping with stress. A lot of people became stress managers. In 1992, the Royal College of Practitioners invites the PSI services to submit a paper on the use of hypnosis for lesser psychiatric disorders. And this paper was published in 1992 uh, handbook for GPs. Now, this is a huge feat, again, and this is excellent, but we need more of this, more research, more public papers, as you all may know, it does take funding to do this research, or you need some backing. And so it's not as easy, I think. In 1993, the New Scientist magazine published the results of the largest survey ever recorded of stopping smoking methods. So this is 1993, and it covered several continents. The results showed that the use of hypnosis was far more effective than any other method used. I believe that's still the case. Based on my own private practice and treating people to stop smoking with hypnosis, I believe that's still the case. When I first started my practice, my hypnotherapy sessions would be two to three to stop smoking. But through the years, after two or three years, I got it right down to one session. And so I only offer one session to stop smoking. And, you know, with all this old follow up and all that, I just don't find it's necessary. I find one and done. In 2000, the General Hypnotherapy Register, the GHR, was formed, of which I'm presently a member. And in 2001, the General Hypnotherapy Standards Council was established and it's responsible for overseeing the criteria for the ongoing register of the individual hypnotherapy practitioners within the General Hypnotherapy Register. It brings us up to now, really. There's been uh, some push forward to do more research around hypnotherapy. Uh, whilst the NHS offer EMDR now, which is amazing, uh, they are still using more what they see as scientifically based therapies like CBT. And hypnosis is still out there in the ether as this austere practice or modality when it works. And I think the only way to change this is to just keep talking about it, which is one of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast. So I'm going to give you two quick case studies. And of course, lots of things I'm going to say have been changed. And just I, I will just give you a gist of it. So I did see someone to stop smoking once. And uh, they said that they um, were coming because they were sent by a partner to stop smoking. Now, that's always a red flag because do you want to stop or does your partner want you to stop? So going back to my sort of sitting in class and then not ever smoking again, 
it is down to what you really believe. So we put that aside and did a little bit of, this is the analysis part with the hypnoanalysis part. And we had to look back at the person's life and what they've been through, also their present situation, how much stress they were. And in doing so, we found that they were moving in a few weeks' time. So this was not the opportune time to add in a stop smoking session. It's what I thought. However, and this is why the analysis part is so helpful, in digging a little bit deeper, this person was able to push forward in their life through times of pressure and stress. Now, many people are like that, and we can't say it's wrong or right. It just depends on how it affects the person. So in actuality, it was a good time for them to do the session, and they were very successful. As far as I know, they've never smoked again. I actually uh, ran into them, I think maybe seven and a half years after the session, and they, I, I, was, I was shopping in a supermarket, and I felt a little tap on my shoulder and I turned around. It took me a minute, uh, you know, because I see a lot of clients and it's hard sometimes. People change their hair, they lose weight, all sorts of things. But it was the person and they said, you know, I just can't tell you. I can't thank you enough. It's just I can't believe I stopped. And I think, I think they said their partner still smoked, but it didn't even bother them. So that can be done. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, email me at inquire at theinquisitiveren.com. That's E-N-Q-U-I-R-E at theinquisitiveren.com. Be sure to check all social media, especially the Facebook page, for new topics and new interests. And if you're an expert in the field, I'd love to hear from you. Or if you'd just like to have a chat, contact me. Let's get you on the show. Now. Let's get back to the show. Another example is that someone came along to deal with their fear of spiders. And I know this is very common, and arachnophobia is very, very common. Uh, but this person was adamant that they didn't have a fear of spiders. It was actually... Yet again, it was one of their children who said, you, you've got to deal with this. And it wasn't, you know, you have to choose your time. And this is the analytical part, of course. But actually, I would argue to say they, were, they did have a fear and they knew they did because that's what got them into the room, not what their children said. They got into the room to see me because they knew they had a fear of spiders. But we did some research and actually... It was the issue of control. And after three sessions, that was gone. It was about a fear of not being in control. That's as much as I, uh, I can say about that. But sometimes if you feel as though you have no control, you may be six foot three and you look at a tiny spider and it's tiny, you could easily squash it. You know, you could easily eliminate the fear. But for whatever reason, you don't want to even go near it. The fear isn't the spider itself. The fear becomes about what it is the spider represents. And that's where the hypnotherapy became useful. We had to find out what the spider represented. And it did represent something for the person. And once we got that out, it was able to, it, we were able to move forward. They were able to move forward. And that took three sessions. So it was really the second session that they were open enough to be able to go back to that bit. And, and yes, a lot of times you have to go back in time. Uh, sometimes you don't. A lot of times you don't either. So it's just, it just depends. A few years ago, I did an audit of my practice. I, I think it's very good practice for Hypnotherapists, or well, all therapists, I think, should audit their practice. I don't mean financially. I'm, I'm talking, well, that should be done too, but I'm talking about an audit of your practice, literally to get feedback. So it was a huge task. I had sent out lots of um, 
emails and asked people to reply. And I did, I got a lot of response. So one, it, a lot of it was positive. I will say, I will say most of it was, 99% was. Um, however, I did get one response back from a person uh, because one of my questions was um, on the form, what was, what, was there anything that you found that wasn't that useful or helpful? And the person put on the form, uh, yes, I was told I could only do the hypnotherapy in one session and I really wanted to have more sessions. Uh, but then, you know, the part about the, ha have you stopped? Have you? Yes, they had stopped. They never smoked again. So very interesting. That was the only thing that they ca could come up with, which for me was a very successful audit um, and a, a very successful outcome that the client enjoyed the session so much that they wanted more of it. But we had dealt with the problem. So I don't do hypnotherapy just willy-nilly, you know, it's not just going to be random, just come in, have a session on what? There's a focus, there's a point, that there's a goal we have. If you want to relax like that, buy one of my MP3s and listen to them. Uh, I've got a really good one on relaxation, uh, one on letting go of things, so one on being calm. There's a lot that you can, you know, clearing your energy, but when you look at hypnosis or the hypno, the therapy part, hypnosis plus therapy, which is hypnotherapy, we're looking at the therapeutic aspect, which I believe is the analysis part. And that's not just random. You, you have to have a goal with hypnotherapy. So I just wanted to throw that in. Overall, I have found hypnosis to be a huge asset to my private practice. I use it in a lot of cases. In, with, even with counseling, there are many times where I will ask people to listen to a tape or CD. In, you know, when I first started, it was on cassette. I would literally sit in my office and press record and record a cassette for them. They take it away and listen to it. And then it became recording on CDs. Now, some of my CDs are still available on Amazon and, and iTunes, I think. Um, but overall, you do have to listen a few times, just like you would be coming to a session. I will address this, though, because recently I had someone come to me to ask me to mentor them. Uh, I've had somebody, you know, I, I am a supervisor for hypnosis, hypnotherapy practice. My supervisees... Uh, often ask different things. So one of my uh, clients who I'm mentoring has asked, uh, they started hip the hip therapy course, but they're not quite sure about going into practice itself. I, they feel that they've got what they need. And so now that we're looking at setting up a practice, they've done all the research, which I found really interesting. I hadn't done lots of it when I started, but yet it was successful. But They've done the research and they said to me recently that they find the uh, field oversaturated, that there's too much free online, and that they cannot find that people would actually come to see them, pay money, travel. And so we discussed the online stuff and they were saying, but still, there's a lot out there. So we did talk about that. I would say this, I agree with them. I agree that times have changed. A lot has changed since we all set up our practices, my, myself, my colleagues, my close friends, and where I was seeing eight people a day just for hypnosis, just for hypnotherapy. A lot has changed. I went along with that change by producing CDs, producing things. The one thing I won't do is a stop smoking one because it's very specific to the client. It's not, you know, it is tailor-made for the client. So I, I can't do a general stop smoking one. I refuse to do that. I don't believe that's helpful. Not from my point. Maybe other hypnotherapists have been successful with it, but I'm not inclined to produce one. However, I do find that 
there is a lot free on YouTube, on Spotify, everywhere you look, the internet, you can find lots of free hypnotherapy. And so people aren't prepared. Now, what they're missing is the one-to-one, -one, and what they're also missing is the therapeutic part, the analysis part that only a hypnotherapist can give to you. And in closing, I do want to talk about, which I forgot to do, guys, the difference between hypnosis and hypnotherapy and hypnosis and stage hypnosis is the art of stage. It's for show. Stage hypnosis is for show. It's entertainment, is to show people something, to show off. And hypnotherapy is totally different. And the stark difference is in hypnotherapy, we're treating psychological, physiological issues, even things like... Um, high blood pressure, we're looking, you know, to lower blood pressure with hypnosis. We're looking to treat many medical conditions as well. And, uh, you know, as a, as a complement, you know, it's a complementary therapy. So as a complement, I have to say hypnosis has helped me to lower my blood pressure. It's helped me in many ways. So also uh, what they're missing is that one-to-one -one and they're missing the element of, uh, how do you say, authenticity, where you are seeing the person face to face. You're also catering the session towards them. It's not a blanket general thing session. It's not sit down, close your eyes, be quiet, <laughs> you know, <laughs> go into trance, one, two, three, you're awake. It's not that, it is a lot more personal and it's catered to treat your condition specifically. So there's nothing like that that exists. I've certainly listened to some of them just for research as well, especially when I was thinking about doing my own and I just didn't find any that were, and uh, this is not going to sound great really, but uh, to treat something long term, you've got to get the personal stuff out. That's what I'm trying to say. That doesn't mean to say that those recordings haven't helped people. They have, I'm sure. So that's it, folks, <laughs> pretty much. That's Hypno, all things Hypno overall. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, make sure you just give me a shout. Uh, email me or leave a message here. I will answer you. I will always come back. And if you want a session, let me know. Uh, it's got to be something specific, though. Also, you know, I do use hypnosis with past life aggression. If you want to know more about that, I did do a podcast on past life regression. You can have a listen to that as well. So thank you again for listening. Have a wonderful week ahead and hope to see you again soon. Your mental health is a priority. Nine Peaches Therapies offers gentle and soothing therapy for your mind, body, and soul. These self-help recordings focus on improving the quality of your life by providing you what you need right now, be it confidence, positivity, restful sleep, or relaxation. The soothing, calming music has been specially composed to accompany the body of words created by me, an expert in this field, to help you to achieve the best result. Reprogram your mind using the most gentle and effective guided meditations that can help you to clear and cleanse any unwanted energy that may be negatively affecting your life. Improve the quality of your life in just a few minutes a day. Nine Peaches Therapies, Holistic Therapeutic Consultancy. Thanks so much for joining me today. Be sure to follow on all podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. Also, check all social media, especially the Facebook page, as there'll be new topics listed and new guests. 
and also Twitter will always have the new and upcoming episodes. But make sure you subscribe so that you never miss an episode. See you soon.